just a speaker. Great. Okay. So to all programs, all students? Yeah. Usually it's mostly the, uh, the business and IT program and the uh, ETSP program. Students that come in here, but it's open for anyone to come in and okay. join. Okay. And most of you guys are within the IT side, I can tell. Is that right? And most of, of us are in a database program right now. DB, okay. Yeah, okay. A lot of DB network, web. But many of us were in previous web foundation certificate programs. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay, good. Well, so Brian uh, asked uh, if I could come speak. Do uh, you guys all, are you all working with Brian Vance now? Yes. Okay, good. So Brian was one of my instructors as well. Uh, he and I are still actually good friends now. Uh, we stay in touch. I graduated in 2004, I want to say, uh, with a computer, computer science degree from here web technology degree from here. And then I ended up actually uh, transferring to the University of Washington. So he asked me to come to speak on, on kind of my career. I'm still fairly uh, new in my career, probably been in the workforce seven years now. And uh, can you hear me okay? And so my career path is a little bit different straight from the tech side. Again, I did web technology here, but then I went to the business degree next door at Waffle, and then I ended up in a couple different areas, so I'll talk about those in a little bit. Uh, just for some perspective, this is kind of my, where I've been uh, and where I'm currently at. Uh, can you guys see that all right? I initially started out at Eddie Bauer uh, Company, and I worked there actually as an accountant, uh, doing accounting reconciliations, <coughs> and uh, realized I did not want to do accounting. So, not necessarily surprising to start somewhere and you realize that's not what you want to do, but then you got to find and discover what you want to do. I ended up coming here at Cascadia. Uh, I heard about e-commerce and the exciting elements that e-commerce was back in the late 90s, uh, right around the bubble. Uh, but I was really interested in learning what it is, really, and uh, how to technically do it, how to design it, and then what is, what is it trying to really solve. So I got a good foundation here. As I mentioned, I went over to the University of Washington Bothell. First, I couldn't go straight over there, so I had to stay here a little bit longer and get my transfer degree. And then I was able to transfer to, to Bothell. And I focused in the business program, which is focus in MIS, Management Information Systems. So I still stayed on the technology side, but uh, I really wanted to focus at the business and the management side of it. So no more coding, but I understood I understand it still today. I don't code today. I don't develop today. Uh, most of that, I work with teams that do the development based on uh, my requirements. So, but I, I still have to understand what they're doing before I can say, yes, go make it happen. It's not magic. There's effort where you need to be knowledgeable in how it happens. Uh, at UW, uh, I actually got an internship at a company called Microvision. You guys had a speaker from my region as well. Uh, his name Neil Evans. I worked with him. Uh, I started there initially, like I said, as an intern. Uh, worked on a, a cool product that they had, uh, which was a wearable computer, augmented reality. Um, think Terminator. You had an image floating about arm length away. Uh, but we had a problem. We thought we were solving with it. Uh, technicians working on cars, uh, trucks. They could be more efficient working on vehicles uh, if they have the information right where they're at. So they don't have to walk to a computer to get the information. They can have it at their point of task. Uh, the problem, though, wasn't beneficial to the business, and, and meaning it was a very expensive tool, and there was market challenges with that tool as well. Uh, but I worked with that product, and then we worked in, and basically pioneered the Pika projector on the market. Uh, so I worked on the marketing side of it, but then I also moved into the product management side of it. So actually, hey, we have an idea on paper. How do we actually get it to be produced? The product is called ShowWX. So this is a, an image of it. So it's a projector the size of an iPhone. And you can connect it to an iPhone or an iPod. And you can get a bigger image than the, than the iPhone or the iPod app. And so uh, the complexity of not only how big should it be? 
how bright is it, what's the battery life, all of these different requirements that you and I make every day as consumers to the products that we buy. Uh, we go to Best Buy and we look at TVs. Why do we buy this TV over that TV? Is it price? Is it size? Is it quality? Is it connectivity? Um, all those things we make decisions on. And as a product manager, my role is to define what those requirements were and manage the actual creation with the technical team. The solution, the specifications need to match the requirements. Uh, so spearheaded that product. Uh, the product launched in 2009, and some iterations came beyond that. Uh, and there's still a lot of uh, exciting uh, areas of the technology. Uh, they're working with Pioneer, uh, actually most recently, which is uh, pretty good for them. I left them uh, in 2010, uh, and I actually did a variety of consulting, uh, marketing consulting uh, for some companies. Uh, and then now, currently, I'm actually at a company called BDA, and it's Susan Deutsch and Associates, and they're actually just over here in Woodville. Have any of you heard of BDA? So, have you heard of Power A? Probably not either. How many of you guys play video games? Consoles, 360, PS3, Nintendo Wii. So Power A, is a brand owned by BDA, and they make video game accessories primarily for all those platforms. Uh, so when you go to Toys R Us or Best Buy, and you go look in the video game section, you'll see a variety of products uh, around cases and controllers uh, that are designed by Power. I work on their digital side, uh, which is in their website side. Uh, so I work on PowerA.com. Uh, that's the website that I drive a lot of the development, growth, updates. Um, we sell products direct, but then we also do a lot of marketing direct. Um, I recently just started there in January, so I'm still coming up to speed on things. Uh, we have some exciting things happening. Uh, E3 is happening uh, beginning of June, uh, so there should be some excitement out in the marketplace just for all video games, uh, publishers, and titles. I'm sure. Uh, Diablo 3 is, is perfectly timed so people can get a break and see all the new stuff. But we, we do, uh, again, very specific into uh, video games, accessories, and marketing. So. What is E3? E3 is the entertainment. That's a good question. I'm not sure what the actual three is. Is it like electronics and entertainment expo? Yes, yes, exactly. Perfect. I only know it as E3. Uh, E3 is a, a specific video game entertainment show. Uh, there's a variety of trade shows out there. I've done a lot of uh, CES, Consumer Electronics Show, uh, when I was at Microvision. Uh, a variety of other trade shows. But this is where you can get a lot of buyers be buying stuff, retailers, and then you get a lot of the uh, companies announcing the products, the, the software titles. So it's a pretty cool event. I've not been to one myself, but uh, I've always watched it through blogs. Announcements. So, what I've really done is, is my education became my foundation as I kind of look at it uh, in both web technology, uh, digital technology. Uh, and then I also had a, a very awesome opportunity to learn a lot about hardware and electronics. Uh, nothing I had formal schooling in, uh, but as I will talk about in a bit, something I really pushed myself to learn. And that's something beyond, beyond your studies. You're not learning. Uh, you're not keeping pace with uh, your peers. In the world. But I'm really focusing myself. Uh, I've, I've got kind of strengths both on the product side, as I mentioned, solving problems. We buy products, uh, and these products are actually a service. They're solving some problem for us. A car, I buy a car. It's solving my commuting problem. I can't. I don't want to walk everywhere. I need to get to work. Just same thing as I buy a computer monitor, solving my display issue. I need a bigger monitor so I can actually be more productive or see more information. So you got to think of that way from a, a problem perspective, from a business side. But then also the marketing side, uh, which is something I'm very much doing right now, which is creating demand. So products exist, but how do we know about them? How do we learn about them? And there's so many different channels and avenues that we can start to learn from them. Uh, that on the marketing side, there's strategies and techniques that uh, technology drives that we put together, put to use as tools. Uh, I'm not going to talk 
any of the specific on those tools. Uh, I'm going to actually focus more on some lessons learned in my career and things that uh, you guys may have already experienced, um, but some things that when I was uh, first starting out, uh, it was you know learn the technology, and I think that when you're in these kind of inst uh, institutions, you're going to get a technical understanding of how things work. Uh, I'm not going to try and give you any tips on those. I think you're at the right place for learning it, but I'm going to try and give you some lessons learned that um, are kind of the soft side, uh, softer skills when you are either a developer when you're doing a, uh, an intricate database design, and I, as a business person, come to you and say, I need you to change it. Uh, you can also understand what I'm looking to achieve, and those are things that uh, you guys as technical developers need to, to keep in mind, and uh, I'll give you some of those kind of insights. Because uh, I kind of straddle both, both areas, understanding the technology side, but then also understanding the business problem side. side. Alright, so definition. This is one of my, uh, one of the areas that is one of the uh, enigmas of working in teams working with others, in fact. Um, what color is red? What color is blue? Right? And what oftentimes happens is what is good, what is good enough. Right? Both have the same word, good. But one of them implies a different direction. Right? What is good enough? Coming up to the ball. What is good enough? But what is good? But it doesn't seem to have a level. And it's all, all you need is you need context around it too. Right? So is that good? Is that color good? Is that okay to launch tomorrow and use for this purpose? Each one of those was just a little bit different statement, but every time I said it, it got a little bit tighter. Your context started to come, come in. And I've had a lot of experience where definition definitions have been different. We say that's blue, but look at how many blue colors we have there. Yeah. Right? And then we can start to argue and say, okay, well, we're just going to talk blue. It starts, does that eliminate, does that start right here? Maybe we should use green and yellow. Okay. Is that, is that yellow? Or is that yellow? Or is that green? Right? So we start to narrow it in, but then that's where we have to have conversation, discussion. Uh, I can give you a story, uh, certainly won't be naming names, but a story uh, where I asked in my product experience, I need a black box, a literally a black cardboard box. And I was working with a team in China, and I said, I need a black box. And they said, okay. And so, great, I'm going to get a black box. Well, I've got almost a black box. I got it, it was uh, uh, kind of a Gray, really dark gray, and that's what prompted this color, right? I got a really dark gray. I didn't really specify the color very well. I said black, and there's so many shades of black, okay? And I didn't specify the size. I didn't specify the um, thickness of the cardboard, the core it. I didn't specify was it recyclable, should it be recyclable. I didn't give a very good definition of what I wanted, and that was a failure. And that was something that, as simple as a black box, right? I spent a lot of cycles going back and forth. I got a black box, but it wasn't the same definition. And as you work in a global environment, the same thing can happen. If you're working on a database, I need a value. Okay, what kind of value are we talking? Is this an integer? Is this a, a, just a straight text? How many characters should it hold? How many uh, fields, how many, um, instances will I be getting into it at one time? How stable do I need to develop it? So these, these are all transition, but it really all comes back to the definition. One thing that is a pet peeve of mine as well is a word we use every day, I use it quite often, is the word sure. Do you want to have coffee? Sure. Is that yes? Is that sort of no? What is it? It's kind of in between, right? It's kind of like, is that a green in between the, the blue and the yellow? 
it's, it's simple and, and you know it, it's humorous at the coffee level. But if I say, can I make sure that this data uh, has this level of integrity? Sure. Okay, is that, I need a yes or a no, it's binary. Just like, it's on, it's off. And in that situation where you're asking the question, sometimes it's best to ask a question back to get more clarification, to help open up the definition. Well, let me understand your context. Are you talking uh, integrity at a specific period of time, or are we talking something else? And sometimes when I ask the question, I actually don't mean that specific thing. I'm asking for something else. I'm, I don't know how to ask it in other ways. But if you start to come back and ask questions, we can start to come up with what the real root is. Ownership. I haven't seen very many of these around here. I see a lot of the crows here, though. But uh, we'll get my... Uh, pun on this here soon. Uh, ownership is an interesting term. Uh, sometimes, if you're, let's say, an owner of a business, do you really own the business? Who do you answer to as an owner of a business? Clients. Customers, exactly. So, everybody wants to be an owner, but everybody will have a boss. If you're an owner of a CEO, if you're the CEO of a big business, you have shareholders. Uh, Facebook today, wonderful news of their uh, IPO. A lot of millionaires out there, billionaires uh, from them. But in, in the context that you guys need to be aware of in the world is the freedom to own things, right? Own the design of a specification. I own the design, or I own the updates to the site. And that's what I mean, what nose can I touch? Because sometimes you all hear the uh, tons of cooks in the, in the kitchen, and uh, nobody owns it. And that happens. Everybody has their opinion on it, and then all of a sudden nobody owns it if it's bad. And so sometimes you have to know who's going to take the glory and who's going to also take the failure. And failing is going to happen. You just need to understand it. It's not the end of everything but it's an opportunity to learn. But it's also important to know, uh, as you become a leader, how you enable others to own things. To own things. Uh, as I've grown in my career, it's, oh, yeah, I can do it, I can do it, I can do it. And I start to take on things, and then all of those things start to not come out as good as they should. And that's where then I need to start to step up more as a leader and have and enable others to take ownership. And Sometimes it's hard to say, can you take this? And many times, the result is yes. When you get in a good team, those people, what drives you is yes, I want to take that. I want to learn. Uh, I'm a big advocate of motivation around, you are motivated by the work. I know a lot of developers that are very excited to do good work because it's a puzzle. You know, They're solving a puzzle. It feels great to have the puzzle solved. It doesn't feel very good to not have it solved. Sure, we also want money. That's a side effect that we, we live, we need to have it. But solving the puzzle is very important to you guys, and me as well. But there, there does become a balance between freedom, you know, ah, let's just go do this, uh, because you will fail in some cases. Uh, but then also, you need to understand who owns what. Who is the nose I can poke on? My reference to the seagull here is, is a story, surprise, surprise, um, where there was a feature of a product I was working on, and an exec made a quick decision on the inclusion of a new feature to the product. And I was the product owner, and I didn't know about this feature. But I learned about it after the feature was starting to be and that started to cause a lot of uh, tension within the team because the exec came by and said, this needs, to ha this needs to be in there. But I was the owner of driving what the requirements needed to be. 
I was making the decisions on this is in, this is out, and this is what we can negotiate on what happens. I had a list of things that needed to begin before this feature, and a rationale for it. So there needed to be a dialogue. And my point is, I was enabled to own it, but then it was not followed. So it was not understood uh, at the management level that, hey, this is a feature change and we need to, we need to go through the right channels and process to get it reviewed. Uh, the, the feature did not make it into the product. We had a variety of conversations around it. And support. I've already made a decision on this feature and this is my rationale. And I was enabled to communicate that and then own that decision. Uh, decisions will always need to be made, just who will be making and if you can have that up front while you're at the beginning of a project or working together as a team, don't be afraid to say, who owns the database design? Who owns the UI? Who owns if a problem comes up? Who's going to make that decision? And when it's before the crisis happens, it's so much easier to say, well, I'm sorry, I messed up on it, or let me address it right away. You know whose nose to touch on that. What do you mean by touching the nose? Uh, you know, there will always be somebody, when you're creating something, I want to be able to say, you own the database design, right? And you understood, yes, I do. Uh, in some cases, you're going to have people distributed. I'm working with a team right now in Bellators. And I, those are the questions. Who's working on this site? What's the name? Who do I need to contact if I have a question? Who do I need to send this information to? And it's uh, certainly don't recommend you go and actually touch them on the nose. <laughs> uh, but it, it is one of those, you know, you start pointing. Well, I thought he had it. I thought she had it. That's the problem because there is no uh, visibility. What's the seagull story? So the seagull story uh, is actually, uh, in some circles, Executives are known as seagulls. They uh, tend to fly in.